continue our series called, or entitled, I Am Called. God has called. He has a calling on every one of your lives. And the scripture verse for this series is Ephesians chapter 4, 1, where Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And if someone in prison can urge us to live this kind of life, may we live this kind of life, amen? Uh, this series is all about discerning the will of God, the callings of God in our lives, that we would hear the callings, that we would step into the callings. For the high school that is trying to figure out what's coming after high school, for the adult that's uh, in the throes of pa raising parents and you're trying to figure out what is it that God would have for me uh, in this time of life for the single person that is just blossoming, blossoming and accomplishing great things in their lives and just wants to be sure that they're in the callings of God. And so we've been studying what God says about his callings in our life. I want to begin today with a few quotes, inspirational quotes that I find uh, wonderful when we think about calling, when we think about our lives. And the first one is coming from a guy named Buckminster uh, Fuller, Buckminster Fuller. And this is what he says, or he asks a question, what is the job, what is my job on the planet? What is it that needs doing that I know something about that probably won't happen unless I take responsibility for it? Great question. What is my job on this planet? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to waste it. Let me engage in it. Michelangelo, also a quote from him, he says, the greater danger for most of us is not that we aim or that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. And might I just ask you today, are we aiming too low? Uh, should we start to aim higher? Is God wanting us? Is God wanting to do more, us to do more in our lives? And then the Apostle Paul makes this statement, for we are God's masterpiece. Let's just stop for a moment and consider that you are a masterpiece in the eyes of God and with the hands of God. He has made you. Uh, there's no one else like you in this world. And he has purposes, he has plans for you. Paul continues to say he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And before you were ever born, this is the mystery of it all, before you were ever born, God had plans for your life. And so we, today we step, we continue to step into this, how do we hear the callings of God in our lives? And today I have no intention of trying to answer all the questions, I just want to get the uh, juice is flowing today. I want to get you really just thinking today like, and, and considering what are the callings that God has in my life. Uh, recently, our men's group, we meet in the center of Simsbury on Wednesday nights about 7.30. We have a group of about four or five guys that we gather together and we're talking, to, we're all dads, we're all husbands, we're, we're talking about these different things. And most recently, we've been working through a series called Redeeming the Time. Redeeming the time. Let's redeem our, the time in our lives. And in this series, uh, a guy named Jordan Rayner, who uh, videoed the series that we've been watching, uh, he describes uh, this, this five-story building. It's similar, it's a metaphor for our lives and our priorities and God's plans for our lives. And on these five floors, on the top floor, he begins to explain things that we need to understand about our lives so we don't waste our life. The first one is we need to understand our mission in life. And he says, I'm going to make it easy for you. You don't have to figure that out. You don't get to choose it. God chose it. And your mission in life is pretty simple. It's to glorify God. It's to reflect his glory. It's to image him, it's to worship him, that the world would know, that they would look at you, you are like a mirror reflecting the image of God and that you would glorify him in your life, in everything you do. And then he goes down to the fourth floor and out of the mission for our life to glorify God, now things get a bit more specific for each of us. There are callings, specific callings that he has in your life. And Jordan actually looks at his in three lanes as he calls them. He says, number one, I'm called to be a husband. Number two, I'm called to be a father. Number three, I'm called to be an entrepreneur. And he just sort of says, that, that's my callings in my life. And for me, I've talked about this before, I won't name them today, but I have five callings in my life. And those sort of guide everything that I think about in my life as I think about 
what God has for me? What are your callings? Is there clarity at this season in your life what the callings are? And then Jordan continues on, and I'll just put the next three floors down, but uh, out of the callings come the long-term goals. And for him, he wanted to write books and to sell a certain number of books. And maybe for some of you, it's a goal, it's a long-term goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal for you that you would uh, you know, start a foundation that would support people in the world financially. Maybe for others of you, it's a long-term goal that you would step into another career. Uh, and that comes out of the callings that God has for your lives. And then he moves down to quarterly goals, and those are sort of like the next three or four months. What are the, 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 the goals in the next three or four months that are necessary as I continue to move forward in the, in the long-term goals, and then we get down to the tactical day-to-day. Uh, let's pay the bills, let's finish the work projects, and let's serve. And I think here's the problem, or maybe one of the fears that I have, is that we spend too much time with trying to make life and accomplish the last two floors down here without clarity on what God has for us up here. And it's like the person said, that the, the, the great fear, in fact, the quote's coming up here, the great fear I have of my life is not that I will get to the end and not have accomplished anything, but that I will get to the end and realize that I lived for the wrong things. And what a shame it would be that we would spend our time, that we would spend our years doing the very things that the world is about but is not about the ways and the callings of God in our lives, right? And so the hope today and in this series is that we would prayerfully consider, explore with God what are the callings that he has for each one of us. And today what I want to do is I want to just continue to learn from the life of Moses. Last week uh, we started with Moses and we learned a few lessons from Moses' life last week. I want to learn some more today. But uh, if you weren't here last week or you don't know the story of Moses, he was born in a time of great suffering. Uh, The Egyptian or the Hebrew people were in slavery to the Egyptians And the Egyptian pharaoh was trying to control the population because the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were growing so large and becoming so powerful that he said, I'm going to kill uh, the the baby boys. And so they hid Moses for about three months, and when they could no longer hide him, they put him in a basket, put him in the water. And if you know the story, he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. He was taken into Pharaoh's household, and he grew up in the most powerful house in the land in Egypt. And you need to see about his life that like God was working all along in his life. God allowed these things to happen so that he would be ready on the day that God would call him to do something that was beyond his wild imagination. And so... God comes to Moses one day. In fact, Moses grows up, and when he's about 40, he sees one of the Egyptians uh, beating one of the Hebrews. And in anger, he lashes out, and he strikes the Egyptian. The Egyptian dies, and now the Egyptian pharaoh is out for his life. And he flees, he runs. He runs to the wilderness. He lives for the, in the wilderness for 40 years with other people, but nevertheless away from the home, the house that he grew up in. And one day he's in that wilderness and he sees a bush burning and he's enamored by this. He's like, what's going on? And it's the presence of God that would eventually take place over the tabernacle, but in a small way he sees He experiences the presence of God, and I think in so many ways in my life, sometimes it doesn't start big, it starts small. It's like, will you take a step of faith in the small, and then God will open the door to the big. And so Moses begins to have a conversation with God in this moment, and God begins to say, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, of which Moses doesn't receive at that moment, in fact, he engages is in a conversation with God, and I'd like to show you this conversation. Conversation begins where God is telling him, you're going to gather the elders of Israel, and you're going to go together. And this is what God says, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, and this is God speaking, they will listen to your voice, Moses, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go 
a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Moses said, but I know that the king of Egypt, or actually God says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. And so God continues. So God says, I will stretch out my hand and I will strike Egypt with all the wonders that I do in it. After that, he will let you go, and I will give this people favor in your sight of the Egyptians. Then Moses answered, but behold, let me just stop there for a moment. How many times does God speak to us and call us to something, and our response is, but? Uh, But, behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to me. So God continues in the conversation. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and he caught it and it became a staff in his hand. This is happening that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put out your hand inside your cloak. Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was like leprous or leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. God says, if they will not believe you or listen to the first sign, that they may, believe, they may believe the latter sign. Well, they continue to have this conversation back and forth. There's another but. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Well, here's another but. But Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall Be as God to him, and take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, Please, let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. I want to make a few observations about this conversation and this calling that Moses is having with God about his life. First thing I want to just observe is that your calling begins with conversing. Your calling in life, at least in my life, has often been more of a conversation than a one-time dispensation. Uh, And you see Moses, God is saying, like, I want to do something. Maybe just as Beatrice shared, like, I want you to start to speak. And maybe some of us would be like, I'm not sure this is what you would have for me. I, I can't do this. And so Moses questions and he wrestles and he ponders. Uh, I think this is so true of our lives. I think of some of the callings in my life, and I know I've shared some of these here, but I know uh, the whole call to Valley Simsbury to launch this campus and launch this congregation was over a, a period of time. It started when I was splitting wood outside in my backyard And God said, summer 2017 is the time that you're going to leave. Two days later, the executive pastor of the church came in and he said, hey, we're starting a congregation in Simsbury. We want you to, or we would like you to consider pastoring it. 
of which I said, oh, that's so interesting. Two days ago, I felt like the Lord said to me, summer 2017. And he was like, oh, we don't want to wait that long. Uh, And there was a long period of conversation in my life that occurred as I discussed back and forth with God and other circumstances occurred where God called me. Uh, If you want to know your calling, it will begin with conversing. Are you conversing with God? Are you asking God? Are you uh, immersing yourself in the word of God that you would know his heart, that you would know his passion, and that you would know his calling? Second observation I want to make is that your calling is aligned with your shaping. Now, this is a play on words because I want to draw out this whole concept of shape that Rick Warren in The Purpose Driven Life and later on Eric Ries wrote in a book to explain the different parts of us uh, that, that blend together to make us us or to make you you. Now, I want you to see this acronym here, this SHAPE acronym, but as they explain, you are made up of a combination of different factors of spiritual gifts, you have a heart, which is the center of your passions, you have abilities, personality, and experiences. And as you consider, what are the callings that God has in my life right now? Should I teach Sunday school? Should I invest in people at a Jakeian Commons? Uh, should I write a book? Like, What are the callings that God has in your life? But as you explore these, know that your calling is aligned with you're shaping, and the hope for us, even though it doesn't always start this way or go this way, is that we would live in our sweet spot. Your shaping begins to unravel what your sweet spot is. Uh, in, in sports, the world of sports, the sweet spot is the place on a tennis racket or a golf club that strikes the ball with maximum effectness, effectiveness using the least amount of energy. And so if we look at this golf ball right now, in fact, it's a beautiful day outside today. Maybe some of you will be running to the golf course this afternoon. I remember a couple years ago, I uh, decided that I would take up golf. Decided to start playing golf all the more, and I even went and got some lessons. And I remember I was out there one day with my golf club, and it was my big driver, and uh, I don't know, sort of pride myself on being a larger than normal guy, and so I was, re- I was uh, winding up, and I was crushing that thing. So I thought. Um, interestingly, the golf instructor was telling me, "Here's the problem. You're swinging so hard. You're working so hard that you're not hitting the club, the ball, with your sweet spot. If you would relax a little bit." and focus on hitting the ball correctly in your sweet spot, it'll go, of which I did. And I crushed that thing while he was with me. Uh, The next time I was out there, I couldn't find the sweet spot again. I don't know what it is about those, uh, though if you've ever taken golf lessons. But uh, finding your sweet spot where you have the greatest effectiveness, where God is able to use you in the most productive way is something that would, be, that would be worth us considering as we think about the shape in our lives. And so uh, if we just go on to the next thing, what I want us to do is I want us to start to look at some of the different aspects. I'm going to start at experiences. And let's just talk about that because the, the fact is that all of us have experiences. Things have occurred in our lives. We've experienced different things in our lives, and God is using those experiences to move in your heart and to uh, prepare you for what he has for you. I think of Moses just for a moment, and I, I was pondering this, but think about him for 40 years. Moses was watching people in slavery, his people in slavery. He was sitting in the palace watching people in the pit of life as they lived enslaved. Think about what that does to your heart. I mean, there's just something that wrecks your heart about it. It's not right, which I think is what led to him lashing out against that Egyptian on the day that he killed him. Uh, There are experiences that have happened in your life 
that are shaping you, that give you passions. Some of you have experienced great pain in your life. God brings purpose in the pain. God is going to use some of the things that you've gone through to guide and bring hope to other people that you would pour into. You should consider your experiences. And, and the principle is, the writer of the book, Eric Ries, writes this, he says, as God slowly crafts the masterpiece of our lives, he uses all of our experiences, not just painful, but the painful, as well as the enjoyable to flesh out the finished product. Uh, there's many of you that have experienced good things in your life, and the world needs you to mentor them in it to guide them and direct them through it. Some of you grew up in a broken home. That gives you empathy. That helps you to understand what people are going through. Some of you grew up in a united home, and you have a great gift. You've seen what that looks like, and you can now influence others with that. Experiences. And the interesting thing about experiences, if we go back to uh, the acronym, is that those have a significant impact on our heart. Your heart is the part of you that is the seed of your passions, and so there are some things that just bring you joy. And God has shaped you. He's given certain things that you just love doing. There's others of you uh, that, uh, you know, the things that you've seen have wrecked you. And you're like, this is not okay. I'm going to solve this problem in the world. That's my purpose in the world, to solve this problem. I think it's interesting how God makes us different. Yesterday, there was a membership class going on over at the office, and there's a couple of ladies there to look after kids, and the kids were still on their way, young kids, you know, three, four, five years old, uh, potentially, and I was sitting in there talking to the women as, as the class had begun. I didn't have responsibilities at that time, and Lisa Wetgen was there, and I don't know, somehow we got talking about middle schoolers and some of the challenges that middle schoolers experience. And Lisa just said, man, I, I just could not, would not enjoy working with middle school kids. I just, man, that, I want to run from that. And I was sitting there thinking, you know what? I remember one time over at Avon, they needed pastors to come help because they were doing this like mom's morning out, and they were short on people, so they said, hey, pastors, come. And I went, I worked with, in a class with, you know, five and four-year-olds, and I was assigned for an hour. I was there a total of 20 minutes. And I was like, I don't know how people do this. I don't know how, how people can, like, spend an hour with a kid writing on a board saying, will you play with me repeatedly, over and over and over again. I was like, I don't know how... And it was interesting as Lisa was saying this because I was like, I, I feel at home when I'm with middle schoolers and high schoolers. I mean, I know how to talk. I know how to, I know how to be immature. Like I just, and I just think it's interesting how God makes us. He's given us experiences. He's given us a heart and a passion for different things. And so we ought to look at our heart. And if we look at our personality, we bring that into it. That's another part of it. Let me just ask you some questions. Are you outgoing or reserved? Are you self-expressive or self-controlled? Are you cooperative or competitive? Are you a high-risk person or a low-risk person? A people or projects, routine or variety? Each one of you in here, God has made you in a certain way to accomplish specific things, callings that he has for your life. And if you are a, a, a highly routine person, then you probably don't need to be in a position where you are trying and piloting and risking big things. Not that God couldn't do that, but find the place, the God, the places that God has for you. Abilities, talk about that for just a minute. In fact, I'll show you this quote here. The, the author says, God doesn't waste our abilities. He matches our calling with our capabilities. You can't lead someone where you haven't been, or it's very difficult to do that. God uses our capabilities. Do you like or do you love working with your hands? Are you musically talented? Can you analyze data? Uh, is your body capable of outdoor work? When you teach, do people listen? 
are people engaged? And I know sometimes, you know, when you start to teach, there's a path to get there. But if you're not, if you don't have the ability to teach, there's two people that are hating it. You and the person listening, right? So find the places that you can live in your sweet spot, serve in your sweet spot. I do want to just go back to the acronym for one more, and that's your spiritual gifts. And this is so significant in our lives because abilities are the natural abilities that you have. You were born with them. You've developed them. But spiritual gifts are not something that you do. It's something that God does in your life. It's, it's, a, it's a gift that God, through the Spirit, endows upon you. Sometimes it works in combination with our abilities, but sometimes it's counter not counter, but it's not in alignment with our abilities. If you think about Moses for a moment, God said, I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh. And Moses said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm slow of speech. I've never been good with my words. I wonder if he would stutter in the place where the Pharaoh was looking him in the eye with fear. Uh, God said, I'm gonna give you the ability to do something that you are not capable of doing on your own. And this is what spiritual gifts are. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says there's a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There's a variety of service, but the same Lord. A variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Let's just leave that there for a moment. Uh, there are spiritual gifts that God is giving you, that God wants to use in you as you join with him in the mission to glorify God and accomplish the callings in your life. Moses had a staff. God made it a serpent. Moses had healthy hands, and God made them leprous hands, and then healed them. Moses was not eloquent and slow. Moses was not eloquent, and he was slow of speech. And God said, "I created your mouth, and I will empower your speech." And so the author of this book says, "We think about our shape. Discovering our shape is twofold. Number one, uh, if you want to discover it, pray about it. Examine who you are." In fact, there's a number of uh, assessments or inventories you can do online to learn about your shape, but explore this with God. But the second thing he says is, in some ways, you just need to step in to ministry. You just need to step into service. And as you step into service, you'll begin to see where your sweet spot is. You'll begin to see when the power of God is unleashed in you, not by your abilities, but by his You'll get to see things happen in your life that you otherwise would never happen. Your calling begins with conversing with God. Your calling is aligned with your shaping. And finally, the last thing I want you to see today is that your calling, if we go to the next slide, your calling is unleashed in surrendering. Uh, as you seek the Lord, you pray about, and you step in and you say, God, like, I just I don't want to waste my life. I want to serve you. I want to join you in the mission to bring your kingdom here on earth. As you surrender yourself to God, he will take your life and he will do something in you that you couldn't write the story of. Moses couldn't write the story Neither can you. And my invitation to you today is that you would step into the callings of God, that you would get clarity and conviction about the callings of God in your life. And then you would start to live out of those, not just getting the day-to-day -day done, but joining God in the mission for your life. Amen? I want to go back to this, and worship team, why don't you come? We're going to close with a song here today, but I want to go back to, actually not back, go forward um, to this slide here. And uh, last week, 
We talked about the going church for the coming Lord. I wonder, and I've been praying that God would call some to leave this country, to go to another country, to go share the gospel. Is the Lord calling you? Is the Lord sending you? Has the conversation begun? Uh, I'll give you just a few other thoughts here to think about. We're doing this epic adventure camp this summer. We're not doing it just to do a camp. We're doing it because this is the most biblically illiterate time in the history of America and possibly Simsbury. Kids are growing up and they don't know the stories of God. They don't know the truth of God. There's some that I believe God is calling you to say, uh, serve, join the camp, meet the needs. You'd be crazy not to step into that if the Lord's calling you to that. I don't have a slide for this, but The Gift, which is a musical production that I think is as good as it gets, uh, it's coming again next year. I can't wait. And I will not be auditioning because I don't think that's in my sweet spot. But there's some of you, I mean, you like to sing. You like to act. Maybe you don't like to act, but God is doing that in you. God is calling you to it, and I would encourage you to step into it, to join God. And something that's absolutely incredible, we'll share the gospel with I don't know how many people through that dramatization of Jesus' life. Uh, may you answer the call. I also have this document here. I don't have a slide for this, but uh, this was handed out as we come in here today, and this is just an easy way to get started. It's just a serving document. It shows a number of the different roles uh, that we have here. I can tell you this. We need more kids' teachers. Uh, we could use some more people working on the production team uh, we need people on the welcome team. We're not done with the Jakey and Commons yet. I believe God has a lot more going on there. Are you ready to step into the calling of God in your life?